Good morning and welcome to this fifth Sunday of Lent as we move towards Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter. We are once again recording here at Trinity Chapel in Shirley. My thanks go out to all of you who are participating from both St. Mark's and Trinity in these collaborative worship services. It has been a joy and a delight to be able to part have participants from both churches in, in our video recording service as we've come through this time of pandemic. Today we are, as you might have guessed, recording at Trinity Chapel in Shirley. We are joined today by Nancy Shepherd and Nan Gulliver, whose voices you'll hear on the responses, and by Trinity Chapel's Minister of Music, Meredith Masinkevich. Thank you so much for joining us, and you will find the bulletin for this week's service in the announcement of the video in the emails we send out or on the website. Our opening hymn this morning is Lift High the Cross. <laughs> and forgives our sins. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray together the collect of the day, which is printed in your bulletin. Almighty God, 
you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for the hearing of Holy Scripture. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please join me in saying the psalm today, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 13. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak, and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For, we, for behold, you look for truth deep within me, and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hold your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Okay, my faith looks up to thee, number Jesus Christ according to John. 
Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake and not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This week, like many of you, I was deeply distressed reading news stories about the shooting of eight people in Atlanta, seven of them of Asian descent. I was struck early on in the first day after the shooting when the police came out and said, oh, it does not appear that the shooting was racially motivated. The young man in question had apparently been targeting people he blamed for tempting him into sexual sin. Not racially motivated, I thought. And I thought that was rather strange because I've been to Atlanta and I can promise you if you simply walked down an Atlanta street and chose eight people at random, you would not end up with seven Asian Americans. You would not have seven women shot. Somehow, it turned out that when he blamed his sinfulness, his temptation to a particular kind of sin, the person that came to the shooter's mind was an Asian woman. And that wasn't coincidence. In Saturday's Washington Post, Monica Hess wrote, I want to hear about the systems that help build the shooter. He didn't come from nowhere. He is not a lone wolf. He might be a predator, but he is one whose worldview was shaped by the culture that raised him. The things he saw celebrated, the things he saw excused, the people he was taught have value, the people who he was taught have none. In other words, he was shaped by sin. When we talk about sin, we often talk about it as though what sin is, is the breaking of a rule, the conscious decision to break one of God's laws. In which case, the Atlanta shooter's sin was breaking the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. And it would be easy just to stop there. We can condemn the sin, we can punish the sinner. His iniquity is full known. But one of the things this incident has revealed is that sin is rarely that simple. It is, alas, not just that we consciously decide to break the rules, but that we participate in systems, we participate in cultures, in ways that lead us to devalue the people God loves. We participate 
in ways of thinking that we're not even aware of until something like this happens and it holds up a mirror before us. What was it about the world that the shooter inhabited that when he went looking for someone to blame for his transgressions, he chose Asian women? Sin is much more pervasive, much more subtle than simply one person deciding to break a rule written in the Bible. And sin is a part of us all. In today's Psalm, Psalm 51, a psalmist I names that. I'm reading a translation from Walter Brueggemann, which is one of my favorites. A psalmist writes, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. That may be uncomfortable to us, who would rather think about ourselves and our children as coming into the world sinless and full of potential. We're not born wicked. We're not born evil. No, we're not. But we do live in a world in which we can hardly escape it. And the psalmist from so long ago knew that. The sin on display in Atlanta was not merely a man buying a gun and deciding to commit murder. It was all the things that allowed that to be a possibility. Prejudice and bigotry against Asian Americans that made him think that Asian women were particularly at fault here, particularly wicked. A society that allowed him to buy a gun without asking him what it was for or requiring a wait period or a background check or anything else. Might even have been a society that said, well, he's a churchgoer. What could he possibly do that would be so terrible? It is striking that people, there were articles written about how the shooter went to church as though being a churchgoer exempts you from sin. We find ourselves with the psalmist crying out, in that case, how can we possibly deal with this? What do we do if sin is so pervasive, if we can't escape it, if sin is there even when we're not aware of it? If we can look at this moment and realize that the sin of racism is still with us even when we don't choose it. Well, this psalm is actually one of great hope. Even as the psalmist says that he is a sinner from his birth, he also cries out to God, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Bergman writes, it is the wager of the psalmist and the deep conviction of ancient Israel that Yahweh's mercy and steadfastness will override and serve as a decisive alternative to sin, transgression, and iniquity. We may find ourselves confronted again and again with the pervasiveness of sin, but we can continue to pray Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. We can confront and name what others are reluctant to name. The reaction when the police said, oh, this wasn't racially motivated, I think for a lot of people was relief. See, he told you it wasn't racism. But we know. We know because we recognize sin when we see it. As Jeremiah says, God has written his law on our heart. And we know sin when we see it. We don't have to pretend otherwise. 
And so we can hold it up to God. David Brooks this week, writing about the sin of racism and the Christian conception of sin as racism, said, the concept of sin gives us an action plan to struggle against, to struggle against it, acknowledge the sin, confess the sin, ask forgiveness for the sin, restore the wrong done. If racism is America's collective sin, then the tasks are tell the truth about racism, turn away from racism, offer reparations for racism. A struggle against sin is not the work of a week or year since sin keeps popping up. But this vision has led to some of the most significant social justice victories in history. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. We can tackle this not because we have some secret answer or we know how to obey the law or we are better than those other people, but because we can cry out to God and we can be assured of his renewal and restoration of our failing and fainting hearts. We have, in Psalm 51, a roadmap for how do we address the racial injustice that still threatens peace of our country and the flourishing of all of its people. Whether we name it or not, we know it's there and we can name it because in naming it, we can ask God to wash us clean of it. We can continue to hold up our own broken hearts, recognizing the ways in which racism took root before we were even aware of it. That we have been a sinners from, the, we have been guilty from our mother's wombs just because that is the water we swim in. We can name it and cry out to God, full of assurance that God's forgiveness and steadfast mercy and love is sufficient for us to continue the work of transformation and renewal. In Psalm, in verse 17, a couple verses beyond where the Psalm today ends, the Psalmist finishes, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Our goal is not to get it all right, but to lay our broken and contrite hearts before God for healing, for washing, for making whole. Because if we can do that, if we can name the sin before us in society, if we can stand unafraid of the failures that we have made, then we can crack open the world for God's renewal and restoration, for the power of resurrection. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Amen. The Prayers of the People, Form 5. In peace let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the holy church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Alan and Gail, our own bishops, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be, may be as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the peace of the world that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, Lord, Lord have mercy. For this congregation, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For our enemies and those who wish to harm and for all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for the peace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers for our families, friends, and neighbors, and that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those we now name before you, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord, our God. For yours is the majesty, O Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. As we come to the time of communion, if you received wafers this week, I invite you to go ahead and uh, take them out and put them on the table in front of you. If not, then I invite you to participate in communion with us by praying the prayer of spiritual communion, which is found in your bulletin when we come to that point in the service. gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation, your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, 
earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gather at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves, a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast.
Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Our recessional hymn this morning is number 495, Hail Thou Once Despised Jesus. much for joining us on this fifth Sunday of Lent. Next Sunday is Palm Passion Sunday and we are going to be doing it in three parts. In person we will offer the blessing of the palms and the first readings and prayers over here at Trinity Chapel at 10 a.m. We're then going to get in our cars and we're going to do our palm procession by automobile. And we are going to drive from Trinity Chapel over to St. Mark's. At St. Mark's, we'll have a drive-up service of Holy Communion, where we will get to participate in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. And then we're going to go home, and we're going to come together again on Zoom at 1 o'clock. And we will do a dramatic reading of the Passion narrative according to Mark. I hope that you will join us for that. If you'd like to participate and be one of the readers for that, please go ahead and reach out to me or Meredith. We're putting together a list so that at least the large parts are already determined before one o'clock. But whether you are up for reading a big piece or a little one, I hope you'll or simply want to sit and listen to that reading and reflect on our Lord and Savior's sacrifice on the cross, I invite you to join us at 1 p.m. So that's 10 a.m. here at Trinity Church in Shirley, 11 a.m. at St. Mark's in Westford, and 1 p.m. online via Zoom. You can do all three or whichever parts fit into your schedule, your life, and your worship for this coming Palm Slash Passion Sunday. We will also be having uh, online services courtesy of our diocese on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter and the Easter Vigil 
Those will be available online all day long for you to participate in on those days at, at, as it fits into your schedule. We're also going to have a Monday, Thursday agape meal via Zoom at 6 p.m. on Thursday, a Good Friday service of meditation and prayers at noon, via, also via Zoom, and then on Easter Sunday, we will have three services, one online, one at here at Trinity Chapel at 1 p.m., and one at St. Mark's in the parking lot at 10 a.m. I hope that you will be able to join us as we make the journey through Palm Sunday through Holy Week to Resurrection Sunday, which I think this year carries a special power. So I hope you'll join us. Have a wonderful week.